I'm eating this. <laughs> What's the matter? The food ain't that bad, oh, baby. Man. This is Aspen Beer, a fictional beer created for the movie Alien. What's most interesting about it is this right here, Whalen yutani with the Egyptian wings underneath. Whalen yutani is the mega corporation that the characters in Alien work for and owns the Nostromo spaceship. The company, which is never mentioned by name, has forced them into this dangerous situation under the threat of losing their pay. So is it just a coincidence that during this pivotal scene, Dallas makes sure that we, the audience, can see exactly who is responsible for Kane's death? Maybe. You can see this Waylon yutani logo on everything in the ship. The walls, electronics, cups, bowls, crew uniforms, and even Aspen beer. The company owns everything, even the people it employs. But this goes way beyond just logos. There is a dark satire intentionally injected into the ship's design that is hiding just beneath the surface of this monster story. One that shows that the true monster is the company itself. I've never seen anything like it. This episode is sponsored by Mubi, where you can stream exceptional films from around the globe. Try it free for 30 days by clicking the link in the description. One of the first things you notice is how the aesthetic of the living quarters has this cheap plastic vacuum formed look to it. The necessity of having everything functional and mass produced makes sense for a mega corporation that likely has a fleet of the same spaceship. But because of that, the crew's living space has this shiny plastic quality that kind of makes it look like they're living inside a McDonald's restaurant. And the first thing that I'm going to do when I get back is to get some decent food. There's this kind of nauseating beauty in this corporate, mass-produced hyperfunctionality. This wasn't an accident. Concept artist Ron Cobb incorporated this aesthetic into his drawings for Alien. Cobb said, One of the things I enjoyed most about Alien was its subtle, satirical content. Science fiction films offer golden opportunities to throw in little scraps of information that suggest enormous changes in the world. There's a certain potency in those kinds of remarks. We'll talk more about this in a bit. What makes the Nostromo's interior so unique is the marriage of practicality and satire. It's almost like pushing a corporate aesthetic to the extreme, like those freaky videos you see on liminal spaces. Cobb's overarching design style is defined by his obsession with functionality and realism which was probably instilled in him while he was providing technical drawings for the US military during the Vietnam War. You can see how the idea of functionality shaped this corporate industrial aesthetic even in his earlier designs. Ridley Scott praised Cobb's expertise, calling him a NASA-level advisor. Something Scott liked about Cobb was that he didn't quote-unquote over-design the sets. But another key aspect of Cobb's background leading up to Alien actually kind of goes against this obsession with realism. From the mid-60s to the early 70s, Cobb worked as a cartoonist for the LA Free Press, which really showed his dark humor and political views. Most of the ones I've seen are specifically Gallo's humor about nuclear war, but the overarching theme of these comics is advances in society causing humans to lose sight of what's important. On Alien, Cobb would get a chance to combine his obsession with function with his irreverent personality in an albeit subtle way. Standard procedure is to do what the hell they tell you to do. The owners of the Nostromo are Japanese, so Scott wanted to make sure there was a Japanese influence in the ship's design. This idea came about because Scott wanted to work with French artist Mobius and ultimately had him design the spacesuits. He wanted the spacesuits to have a Japanese armor look, which then made him decide that Weyland yutani is owned by Japan. According to Scott, this Japanese influence comes in the form of Japanese super tankers, like Japan's Burge Emperor, that were around during the making of the movie. And let's not forget that the movie was made right before the 1980s, when Japan would experience an economic boom that caused many to think that Japan would own everything in the future. The name Weyland yutani was itself supposed to be kind of a joke. Ron Cobb said, I wanted to imply that poor old England was back on its feet and united with the Japanese, who had taken over the building of spaceships the same way they have now with cars and super tankers. And coming up with a strange company name, I thought of British Leyland and Toyota, but we obviously couldn't use Leyland Toyota in the film. Changing one letter gave me Weyland, and Yutani was a Japanese neighbor of mine. That said, the company name isn't mentioned or even really featured prominently until the later movies. They also didn't add the D onto the end of Weyland until the sequel. Even though the brilliant French artist Mobius only had one design that actually wound up in the movie, the spacesuits, his style was a major influence on the Nostromo interiors because Ridley Scott was a huge fan. 
Like a Mobius-designed ship, Scott wanted an Egyptian feel with lots of round surfaces. The Egyptian theme is present throughout the ship's interior in the Weyland yutani logo, a nod to the wings of Horus, which was designed by John Molo. The symbol above the monitor at the back, which is the wings, is actually taken from Egyptian um, temple, and a lot of the elements of architecture in here, if you look around, are rather Egyptian. The logo resembles a winged sun disk, which was used in ancient Egypt as a symbol of royalty, divinity, and power. Ron Cobb made a different logo that was more of an industrial stencil with the interlocking W and Y. Now, I don't know if this is intentional, but there's something a little satirical about appropriating an ancient culture's religious symbols into a design aesthetic for a business. We see this a lot today with aspects of ancient Greece being incorporated into logos and the names of Nike, Starbucks, Goodyear, and of course, Trojan condoms. It's kind of funny to think of a future in which a symbol of a prominent religion today is turned into a company logo because it looks cool. I guess governments have done this. The hypersleep chamber is also suggestive of an ancient tomb, with the arrangement of the cryo chambers resembling a blooming flower. Scott said that he approached the hypersleep chamber in a more atmospheric way because he doesn't think cryogenics is realistic. Back to the old freezerinos. <laughs> Up next, we're talking about the story behind the famous plastic drinking birds. But before we get into that, a quick message from this episode's sponsor, Mubi. Mubi is a curated streaming service dedicated to elevating great cinema from all around the globe. From iconic directors to emerging auteurs, there's always something new to discover. With Mubi, each and every film is hand-selected. It's like your own personal film festival streaming anytime, anywhere. Right now, you can watch this hilarious movie called Frank by Lenny Abramson. The movie is about a man named John, played by Domhnall Gleeson, who follows a quirky semi-fictional band to a remote cabin to record their first album. The band is led by an eccentric frontman named Frank, played by Michael Fassbender, who refuses to take off a large papier-mâché head. It is fascinating to see such a talented actor carry a full-length feature without using his face. You can try Mubi free for 30 days at mubi.com slash cinematyler. That's M-U-B-I dot com slash cinematyler for a whole month of great cinema for free. Coca-Cola, lipstick ring, go dance all night, dance all night. And now back to the show. To fill out the general clutter of the ship, Scott wanted to add in some small tactile details to the set dressing, which is where the drinking bird toys came from. Scott's logic behind all these toys was that wherever you go, even in space, there's bound to be a gift shop. He imagined that the crew would have collected these trinkets at all the various spaceports they might have visited, which fits perfectly with this kind of assembly line aesthetic of the living quarters. Scott came up with the drinking birds on the fly and had someone run out to a nearby London store to buy some. Scott thought of the living quarters as sort of like a hotel, where there would be 10,000 of everything you could possibly need, but a cheap, plasticky, mass-produced version of it. Where's the coffee? Oh, it's brewing. Scott took some inspiration from 2001 A Space Odyssey here. He had been impressed with the space flight to the moon base, when the character lies asleep with his food tray in front of him, and how such ordinary details contributed to the movie's realism, like how the spaceship wasn't that much different from a 747. Harry Dean Stanton said, Ridley wanted to make it look like flying in space was like taking an airplane flight. Make it old hat. Make it as natural and commonplace as possible. Scott thought of the crew's quarters as where the staff of a Hilton hotel would live. It was inspired by the Ares flight in 2001 to have the walls covered with padding to prevent injuries during times when there's little or no gravity. Of course, we don't see any zero gravity moments in Alien, and it isn't explained how the ship has artificial gravity. Scott had to work hard not to just copy 2001's approach by staying away from its clean future look, but he felt that despite his best efforts, the Nostromo still shows that influence. One set that looks like it could have been taken straight out of 2001 is the Infirmary. Cobb's design for the infirmary was one of Scott's favorites, particularly the machine that scans Kane after the facehugger attack, which he called one of the most realistic and beautiful pieces of future tech that he's seen. Scott named 2001 as one of his all-time favorite movies, and certainly the best depiction of futuristic technology to date, given how closely Kubrick worked with NASA scientists to develop it. Kubrick also worked closely with various corporations knowing that they would be heavily involved in the design and function of the future. Alien subplot of the android Ash working on behalf of the company and against his fellow crew members borrows heavily from 2001's HAL 9000. And let's not forget that HAL is one letter removed from IBM. 
But perhaps even more interesting is that many of Cobb's designs were more ambitious in the beginning, involving giant screens, computer readouts, and windows with protective shells that would open to reveal planets ahead of the ship. One of the ideas Cobb was most saddened to lose was his early design for the bridge, which would have been a much more spacious split level with giant windows. He wanted a shot where planets could be seen rolling by on console screens, and then the screens would open up revealing windows through which the actual planets would be visible. But they couldn't afford it, so they had to use something more along the lines of Star Trek, with no windows and a simple viewing screen. These more elaborate ideas were scrapped to save time and money, but a lot of them actually wound up being used decades later for Prometheus, which probably makes sense because the Prometheus ship was meant to be state of the art, and the Nostromo was simply an old star freighter. And let's not forget that Weyland of Weyland Utani traveled on the Prometheus, which itself is a reference to Greek mythology. Because the exterior design was supposed to look like an intergalactic super tanker, they purposefully avoided anything too high tech on the inside. Though Cobb personally disagreed with that take and was at times frustrated with the limits of his influence, Cobb was committed to a certain degree of realism given his knowledge and passion for actual aerospace design and he felt that many of those in charge simply couldn't be bothered to care about things like the lack of sound in space, gravitational effects, and stuff like that. Another way the Nostromo's design pokes fun at megacorporations is through subtle background details, like industrial symbols and color coding, in a way that was both cynical and kind of funny. Cobb developed a futuristic spin on a universal signage that would be used by the crews of Weyland Utani ships regardless of the language they spoke. He called it semiotic standard for all commercial transstellar utility lifter and heavy element transport spacecraft. Like being trapped in a factory or something. And so I, the, the way I wanted to go along with that was to, I, I talked them into all these industrial symbols around and color coding of everything. I thought that would that would be kind of cynical and, and, and uh, create that, that industrial revolution feel, you know, of people getting lost in machines, which I know is part of the metaphor. Some of them were semi-humorous, so uh, I was hoping that would, people would notice where, uh, you know, where that black meant a vacuum and that uh, and artificial gravity meant a red line underneath, and if there was no artificial gravity and it was black beyond this door, it meant don't open it, you know, and so there was a figure of a little space person floating upside down, you know, stuff like that, sort of in, in, in stress. Even the colors of the signage had specific meanings. For example, red means viable, sound, alive, and alertness, black means vacuum, death, and hazard, and blue means lowered thermal condition. At the same time that the signage is necessary and follows an internal logic, it adds this machine-like quality to the environment, where everything is a tool for completing a specific task, even the people living on the ship. Like any other tool, the people are replaceable and the company is willing to sacrifice their lives if it helps the bottom line. And Ash is literally a personified tool. Another bit of subtle design humor was the self-destruct mechanism. Scott liked the irony that it would be necessarily complicated to prevent accidental detonation, but this meant that Ripley had to basically read a manual while fighting for her life. The emergency destruct system is now activated. Notice too that they don't have any weapons to fight the alien, but instead tools that are meant to serve another purpose. Just make damn sure nobody puts their hand on the end of it. Cobb also designed a bunch of insignia designs that each had a specific purpose for the employees of Weyland Utani, and included backstory for the company. For example, this patch shows that the crew member used to work for Red Star Lines before working on the Nostromo. And this patch here on Brett's jacket is kind of funny. It was made for the United States tricentennial in 2076, and is a collector's item in 2122, when Alien takes place. Before Alien came out, movies about the dangers of evil corporations were relatively underrepresented. New York City, in the year 2022. Nothing runs anymore. Nothing works. But the people are the same. But Alien would explore a new angle for evil corporations in movies, a corporation so big that it could be more powerful than a government. The overarching theme that runs through the entire Alien franchise is how the cold, unloving hand of a giant corporation puts profits above the lives of its employees. Ridley Scott said, Weyland Utani, which I figured at that time, and in fact reflected in Blade Runner, was that the world is eventually obviously going to be run by companies and organizations which seemed exotic at the time, but now it's a reality. 
that's where we're headed. And so this was speculation at the time. Funnily, by the time I got to do Blade Runner, the idea was that the Tyrell Corporation was a mega company, which, at what stage does a company decide to have its own private army, or a protection service? At what moment does a company become more powerful than a government? And so that was always the subtext here, and certainly was in Blade Runner. And the company itself is personified by Ash, who behaves as if a corporation is a person. For a long time, it seems like he's working on behalf of the crew, until his true intentions are revealed. And unlike Hal's malfunction, Ash is functioning exactly as he is meant to. The idea, according to Scott, was that Weyland Yutani would plant an android on each ship to act in the company's best interests over the interests of the employees. After all, what if the crew ran off with the resources they've collected? Or what if they pass up an opportunity to acquire an extraterrestrial for the company just because they want to, you know, not be killed? Want more videos on Alien? Let me know in the comments. And if you want to suggest a different movie for me to make a video on, please fill out the Cinema Tyler survey in the description below. I've been doing this series on Alien because it was suggested in the survey, and that survey is what I'll be looking at for future topic ideas.